Okay, we're going to talk about chapter 48 now, the first chapter of the nervous system. Um, here we're mostly talking about the basic functioning of neurons, but let's just take a look at the nervous system. It's divided up between what's called the central nervous system, the CNS, the brain, and the spinal column, and the peripheral nervous system, which are all the nerves that run off of the central nervous system. You don't need to know all these nerves of the peripheral nervous system, but um, um, you may recognize some of them. The sciatic is one that is often associated with lower back pain and pain down the leg because it's a nerve that as your vertebra can be, become compressed, it can pinch that nerve um, and cause some problems. The nervous system functions by having sensory input for via sensory neurons that are connected to different sensory organs that receive information, send that nerve impulse to the central nervous system where that information is integrated and if necessary a response is sent out, a motor output through motor neurons, um, sometimes motor neurons, not all the time, that cause something to happen. You see um, some large object, uh, an elephant charging toward you, for example, you process that information and say, goodness, there's an elephant running at me, and this will then elicit a response of running away. Um, so that's basically how your nervous system works. Basic unit of the nervous system is the neuron. Neurons are a good example of a cell exhibiting form-fitting function. You have the bulk of the cell with the cell body that have the nucleus and most of the cytoplasmic contents. There are dendrites that branch off of the cell body. This long, thin axon, extension of the cell. At the end of the axon, the synaptic terminals that connect to an adjacent neuron. This, the long, thin nature of a neuron allows a series of neurons to form a network a network that can extend throughout your body using relatively few cells because they are so long and thin. At the connection between the two cells, the synapse, this is where neurotransmitters are released. We'll talk more about neurotransmitters a little later. Um, oh, keep in mind that neurons form a one-way network. That is, nerve impulses go one way. They start up at the dendrites and then into the cell body and down the axon to the adjacent neuron. Neurons can come in different shapes. Um, they can have uh, highly branched clusters of dendrites and some that aren't so branched. The cell body can be towards one end or sometimes even in the middle. Um, and again, you have sensory neurons, motor neurons, and then between sensory and motor neurons, you have interneurons. In the nervous system, you have more than just neurons. Particularly in the central nervous system, you have what's called glia, which are, is a cluster of types of cells whose job is to support the neurons. And we'll, we'll see more about them in the next chapter. But in your central nervous system, there's actually more glial cells than there are neurons. All right, nerve impulses. We have to talk about ion pumps, ion channels, and the ions. So in a typical um, mammalian neuron, you have a certain concentration of these different ions, potassium, sodium, chlorine, chloride, and some anions. And you notice it's different than what the situation is outside the cell. So you have more potassium inside and a lot less outside, and less sodium in and more on the outside, for example. And when you have um, differences in anions and cations inside and outside the cell, you essentially get a difference in charge across the membrane, or what's called a membrane potential. And at rest, that is when the cell, when the neuron is not really doing anything, what's called the resting potential, nerve cells have a negative charge on the inside and a positive charge on the outside. Now they have 
positive ions both inside and outside, but you'll notice at the resting potential, we've got all these ion channels, and there are many more potassium channels than sodium channels. Potassium channels let potassium out, sodium channels let sodium in, but at rest, more of the potassium are getting out than the sodium are getting in, and that's why you have essentially a greater number of positive ions on the outside and thus a positive charge on the outside and a negative charge on the inside. Now, the um, way the equilibrium potential is, is sort of calculated is, is using what's called the Nernst equation. And the Nernst equation was developed by a, a scientist long ago with the last name Nernst. And it basically says that you can calculate the equilibrium potential for a particular ion using this equation, the equilibrium potential of that particular ion, and you have 62 millivolts times the log of the concentration of that ion on the outside divided by the concentration of that ion on the inside. All right. And so C, for example, with potassium, it's 140 on the inside and 5 on the outside. So when we calculate the uh, equilibrium potential for uh, potassium, again, we see it's 140 on the inside, 5 on the outside. And you plug this into the equation, it gives you an e equilibrium potential of about minus 90 millivolts. Now with the um, sodium, we see again it's 150 on the outside and 15 on the inside. And we get a positive value, plus 62 millivolts. Now that's just the potential for each individual ion. Well, at rest, potassium is playing a much bigger role on determining the resting potential because a lot more of it is moving out of the cell. So together, the resting membrane potential is a negative value um, because of the potassium moving out. Um, so, there's the Nernst equation. Now, let's talk about an action potential. This is when a nerve is firing or there's a nerve impulse when an action potential happens. So we said the resting potential of a neuron is negative, anywhere from minus 60 to 80. All right. <coughs> what happens is you get some kind of stimulation of that cell and there's a bit of depolarization. That is, the charge becomes less negative on the inside. Well, there's a particular threshold potential at which if you reach that point, you get what's called the action potential. When you get a rapid depolarization of the cell, it now becomes positive inside and negative on the outside. And then it just as quickly repolarizes and becomes negative again on the inside. In fact, there's what's called the undershoot. It kind of goes way low and then comes back to that resting potential. That um, um, dip down below the resting potential is supposed to prevent a, another action potential from happening too soon. Um, now, how does this depolarization happen? All right, so you've got the resting potential. It's negative on the inside, positive on the outside. But what happens when there's a stimulus from an adjacent neuron or from some sensory organ, um, you block the movement of the potassium out, but you continue to let the sodium in as the um, impulse is stronger more of the sodium is coming in, a rapid influx of sodium, causing it to become positive on the inside. That's our action potential. And then after you reach a 
basically the peak of the action potential, we now let a bunch of potassium out, but now we block the sodium from coming in. And so now we come back down to being negative on the inside, and during the undershoot, again, no, no sodium is getting in, but some potassium is coming out. Um, we will use, we, I guess I should say the cell, will use some of these other types of membrane proteins that can pump potassium and sodium across to reestablish the resting potential after the action potential. So what happens is a one neuron receives some stimulus from adjacent neurons, one or two or more. It begins a depolarization up here in the cell body that then propagates through the axon and the action potential basically moves in a wave down that axon and it moves in sort of a jumping fashion from one section to another because if you look at the axon it's insulated by this this material called the myelin sheath and think of it as analogous to the, wire, the, the, the rubber or plastic that covers a wire, that insulates the wire and keeps the electric current inside the wire, where the, the myelin essentially in, insulates the axon. And what happens is the nerve impulse kind of jumps down the, the, the axon from one of these nodes to another. And these nodes are known as the nodes of Ranvier. All right. Um, the myelin sheath has these things called Schwann cells that essentially maintain the myelin sheath. All right. So let's see. So now the nerve impulse has moved down the neuron. You've gotten towards the the um, end of the neuron, the synaptic terminal. And there you have the synapse, the space between adjacent neurons. And as the, as the impulse moves down the axon, it causes the release of neurotransmitters at the synaptic cleft into the adjacent neuron. It's received by proteins that are on the membrane of, in the postsynaptic membrane of the cleft. Um, so you might call this almost the presynaptic membrane. Here's the postsynaptic membrane. And so when these neurotransmitters are received, these ion channels open and allow the movement of ions, potassium and sodium ions, causing a depolarization of the adjacent cell. And so what happens is you have neurons that connect to an adjacent neuron. And some of these neurons can have be excitatory in nature, and some can be inhibitory. And so when you have enough of the neurons that are excitatory feeding in, all right, it can lead to an action potential that causes that neuron to fire, if you will. However, if you have some inhibitory neurons as well that are firing, they can negate the excitatory ones. You never re reach the threshold and the action potential doesn't happen. Um, so if the so if the summation of the excitatory neurons, if their effect, their potential on this is greater than the inhibitory ones, you can get a nerve impulse occurring in that neuron. However, if the inhibitory one is such at a, such a level, it can prevent that excitatory uh, impulse from stimulating the adjacent nerve and causing a nerve impulse. Here's a look at the neurotransmitters. Glutamate is the most common one. Um, it's generally an excitatory one. And um, it's the one that's, again, most often found in different neurons. Um, GABA is another common one. It's more of an inhibitory one. Oops, there we go. Um, other inhibitory ones, like the endorphins, these are the natural painkillers. Um, uh, norepinephrine, think the adrenal glands, it's a neurotransmitter that um, is excitatory in nature. Um, all right.
Um, you don't have to memorize this list by any...